Welcome to the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast, featuring discussions and interviews about the people, places, and events that make Mount Pleasant such a special place. Hi, this is Roger Gaither, your host for the Mount Pleasant Magazine podcast. In this episode, Bill Mascio, publisher of Mount Pleasant Magazine, chats with WCBD Channel 2 Chief Meteorologist Rob Fowler. Now, here are Bill and Rob. Here we are. Thanks to Rob Fowler. He's joined us, the Chief Meteorologist at WCBD-TV. Rob, thanks for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. Hey, Bill. It's great to be on your program. I've seen it on uh, social media, so I'm honored to be a part of this, uh, your podcast. Really enjoy uh, uh, talking about all kinds of things here at Mount Pleasant and, of course, Hurricane Hugo, too. Yeah, that's why I want to bring you on. But before we talk about what we really want to talk about, I want the, the listeners to know about you, man, your family, the kids, you know, things like that. Can you tell us a little bit so they can get to know you? My family's grown really in the last year or so, Bill. Uh, I have a grandson who turns awesome. one in September uh, and so excited. Uh, Ro, he's uh, he's amazing. And I have a new son-in-law just uh, uh, joined our family in July, July 10th. So a lot has been going on in my family. I have three kids. Of course, my wife, Cara, amazing. We've been married coming up on 34 years and we have three kids. Uh, Trey, my oldest, is a pharmacist over at the Children's Hospital. Uh, my middle child, Kylie, the one who just got married, uh, has taught, but uh, she's uh, taken some time off from teaching. And my youngest, Tate, uh, just finished up at Clemson back in the spring, and now he's starting law school at American University in Washington, D.C. I've got a, a daughter-in-law, Amanda. I've got a son-in-law, Thad, and I have a grandson now, Rose. So that's the family unit as we see it right now, Bill. And you and I have been through a lot together, and uh, as time has gone on, lots of changes. They say there's no guarantee in life. Well, change is definitely a guarantee. <laughs> and we've seen so, quite a few of those. Change for the good, though. Yes, that's true. So the kids, do they all live here in town? Well, uh, yes. Uh, my oldest, they live uh, just around the corner in Mount Pleasant. And my middle child, they live in Mount Pleasant. Now, Tate, the one who's in law school, he's the one that needed his wings. So I think he'll be the one, uh, much to our chagrin, my wife and I, that he might be the one to fly the coop, so to speak, and, and not come back here. We'll see. You never know. But everybody comes back to Charleston one time or another. That's hey, you what know, I like to say. Yeah. yeah I want to know, and I bet other people want to know, what was that moment that you really wanted to be, that you knew you wanted to be a meteorologist? Like, what, where were you and when did that happen? That's an easy one, Bill. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1960. And in 1965, when I was five years old, we had Hurricane Betsy. Uh, Hurricane Betsy, a lot of people remember Katrina back in 2005. But before that, Betsy was a landmark storm in terms of flooding. And I was part of that as a five-year-old child. And we had to move from my house to my grandparents' house, my dad's mom and dad's house, uh, which was on the other side of New Orleans and didn't seem to flood as bad as our house did. And uh, it turned out to be true because our house really did get flooded. But my job that night of Hurricane Betsy was to try to keep the water from coming into my grandparents' house. And they gave me dry towels and said, stick these towels under the door to see if we can keep the water from coming in. And that was my first experience with a hurricane. And from that point on, Bill, I couldn't have told you at five years old, I would be doing what I'm doing now, uh, many years later, but I certainly... My interest was peaked, if you will, in terms of the science of weather and specifically hurricanes, which is ironic. I ended up in an area that does get hurricanes. A few years after that, when you would watch the news and stuff, did you gravitate towards that weatherman? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I love what the weatherman did. And I, I loved a few in New Orleans and then we moved around, but I really settled in Atlanta. And I'll tell you what, there was a meteorologist and he's gone now. His name is Guy Sharp. And he worked at Channel 11 in Atlanta. If anybody grew up in Atlanta, they remember Guy Sharp. And I always told my mom and dad, I said, I want to be him. I want to do what he's doing. Because what I really liked about him, Bill, is he did the weather, but he also was very involved in the community. And I think he was kind of my inspiration to, you know, once you get into a certain position, if you've got an opportunity to help out other people, then you should take that opportunity and run with it. And Guy was kind of my, my mentor, if you will, in terms of uh, the way he handled himself in the Atlanta area. One thing for sure that you had a good uh, mentor there because you are truly involved in the community. I think that's a big part of what you do. And I thank you for that. Well, Seriously, Rob, you do a great job with the community. 
Well, I appreciate that, Bill. You know, you've been here a long time and, and this com community uh, welcomed us many years ago. And we just felt like this was where we wanted to put down roots. I was a Navy brat. My dad was a doctor and he was in the Navy. So we moved around to different bases and I never had that that root feeling. And once we got here, this just felt like home. And, and we've been here for quite a while now. It's a good feeling when that happens, isn't it? It really is. And uh, I moved here in Mount Pleasant in 1987. There were 15,000 people. Snee Farm was the country. If you lived in Snee Farm, that seemed to be the end of the world, really. Uh, things have changed over these 34 years, Bill. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Be part of the conversation surrounding Mount Pleasant. Sponsor the Mount Pleasant Magazine Podcast. Podcast marketing is the new, powerful way to brand your business and reach your customers. For more information, visit carolinapodcasts.com or call 843-345-7012. You're listening to the Mount Pleasant Magazine Podcast. When did you start at Channel 2, Rob? I started in Channel 2, September of 1987. I had worked in Savannah doing weather. I moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin for a couple of years. And after two winters in Wisconsin, even though God sent me up there for a reason, that was to meet Cara because she's a good Wisconsin girl. Two winters in Wisconsin as a Southern guy, I said, I got to get back to the South. So literally... I went to the library in Green Bay and they had a magazine on the rack and it was called Broadcasting. And in the back of that magazine, Bill, there were classified ads. And one of the ads was for a chief meteorologist position in, in a beautiful coastal South Carolina city, Charleston, South Carolina. And I'd worked in Savannah, so I was very familiar with Charleston. So I answered the ad. The only problem was when I turned the, the magazine over, I noticed that the, uh, the magazine was like two or three months old. And I said, there is no way this job is still open. I just got here at the wrong time, too late. Well, fortunately, the job wasn't taken. And I sent my resume. And at that time, we sent a little VHS tape of our work. And the news director, Mike Solomon, at the time said, I'm going on a cruise, Rob. But uh, when I get back, I'll look at your tape. And he did. And they flew me down. They put me up at the Lodge Alley Inn on East Bay Street. And I remember Bill uh, walking outside, walking down East Bay Street. And I called my wife and I said, if they offer me this job, I'm taking it. And I did. And I haven't looked back. Rob, I'm, I'm curious. When you first stepped into the station and started working, did you have any idea you'd be there as long as you have been there? I had a four year contract, Bill, and that was at 87. So a lot of people always ask me about Hugo, but I was actually here two years before Hurricane Hugo. But Hugo changed my life and our lives completely professionally and personally, because uh, after we went through Hugo together, as you know, that was kind of a fraternal bond. You had a bond with people. You had gone through something that other people just couldn't understand and you went through it together. So the news director at the time, Mark Pimentel, um, came to me after Hugo and said, Rob, we really feel like you did a good job. Uh, we want you to see this thing through. Would you be willing to extend your contract so we can kind of see this whole thing through? And so I said, sure. So we extended my contract and then uh, the kids were born and they started getting involved. We started meeting people and five years became 10, 10, 15, 15, 20 and then I finally said, you know, that's it. I, I'm not leaving. This is where I want to be. And even that's though crazy. I always wanted to go back to Atlanta because that was my home base, that's where I really wanted to work. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that Atlanta's not that far away. I've got relatives still there. I can drive and then get on I-20 and head back to Charleston, where I absolutely have fallen in love with this city. There you go. Okay, let's talk about Hugo. This is a good segue to talk about Hugo. So go back in your memory bank. The days leading up to Hugo – Describe them a little bit to us, if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, I look at all these storms and I look at storms even off the coast of Africa today or down in the Caribbean, wherever. And, uh, you know, I can't always remember if I said, oh, I got to point out this one. This is the one that's going to be, you know, the one that that's going to hit us. But I do remember because at that time we were tracking everything and we still do that there was this little area of thunderstorms coming off the continent of Africa. And of course, then it continued to move into the ocean. And there was also another storm, if you remember, called Iris that was actually behind Hugo. So we, we were kind of tracking two storms. But I think the Monday before the Thursday that it actually made landfall um, was the time we had, a, we had a summer party at Channel 2. We were over at the old Sand Dunes Club on Sullivan's Island. And it was a, it was a company picnic. And we had a great time. 
And I remember my boss coming up to me and said, Rob, it's Sunday. What do you think is going to happen next week? I said, well, you know, um, Mark, let's wait and see what happens after it comes off Puerto Rico. Because at that time, it was about to hit northeast Puerto Rico. I said, let's see what happens. If it makes a turn, then we should be okay. If it doesn't, then we might really have to pay closer attention to this. It didn't make the turn, as you well know, and kept on moving northwest right into Charleston Harbor. So I do believe that Monday was the turning point where we had to step it into the next year and realize that, uh oh, with a ridge of high pressure, pretty strong to the north, it's not going to make a turn with an area of low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to be blocked into going to the Gulf. So there is going to be an area, a corridor from the Carolinas back to Florida that certainly could be impacted, most likely would be impacted by Hurricane Hugo. Now, you know, it's coming. You see it's coming. What went through your head of what you have to do for your community at that point in time, knowing there's going to be a landfall? I think about this all the time, Bill. You know, what was my mindset? And I think we were all kind of like not in denial, but just kind of like, is this really happening kind of thing? And I was young. I had never gone through this before. So I just kind of went on instincts. And I think we all kicked it uh, into another gear, all that the folks who were there at that time. And we still, all of us still stay in contact with each other. Gary Ross, who was a reporter during Hurricane Hugo, he was just here in Charleston visiting. And we had a breakfast brunch together and really relived a lot of this. So I think, uh, fortunately for us, Bill, I think the determining factor for us, we had a chief engineer, his name was Mike. Mike Opowski. And Mike, in January of 1989, not knowing this was going to happen in September, he had just gone through uh, Hurricane Gilbert in 1988. He had worked at a TV station down in Harlingen, Texas. And he said in January, he said, Rob, do we have a hurricane plan? And I said, Mike, I think we do. Well, we found out we had a plan, but we really needed to dust it off quite a bit because as you know, it'd been quite a while before since we've seen any kind of major hurricane like a like a Gracie or a Hazel yeah. um, or even David, you know, kind of a glancing blow. So he kind of pushed us into that direction. He said, I just went through Gilbert. Man, you guys need to put this plan in action. We need to update this. And because of that, we had a plan. And we, lit, we were in that old Quonset hut that got damaged quite badly. That's not somewhere we wanted to stay. But we kind of fanned our troops out, if you will, and we covered the storm the best we possibly could. But, yeah, those days leading up to it, as it got a little bit closer, you know, you could feel the adrenaline kick in. Your nerves were going crazy, but you knew you had a job to do. You knew people were relying on you because – uh, at that time, there were three TV stations, there were radio stations and the newspaper, and of course, your magazine, which, by the way, did an amazing job covering the storm and your retrospective after the storm, that magazine you put out, I still have in my folder today, which is about a foot thick. I'm sure you remember East Cooper magazine was, oh, yeah. was a predecessor yeah. before Mount Pleasant magazine. And I'm putting the magazine together in my office. And uh, my wife calls me and I, at that point you put it on back then you put it on a plane uh, to, to, to where you get it printed and stuff. And she said, you know, Bill, the airport's closed. The yeah. only place you can go is Columbia. So we got, so we ended up exiting. She knew how to get to me. Right. So yeah. I exited to, to go basically to take care of her and then also take care of the, uh, the magazine, get it off to the printer. Let me ask them, tell me the balance of a meteorologist, of what you need to do for the community and your family. What did you do to balance that and make sure that everything was taken care of? That's a great question, Bill, because, you know, obviously I had a wife. She was five months pregnant with Trey, our oldest. Uh, we lived in Mount Pleasant in Chelsea Park, and but I knew I had a job to do. So she evacuated to Atlanta because we knew this was not going to be a place she needed to be. Um, but as I'm working and I'm churning through this storm, you know, I'm still in the back of my mind wondering, hey, we're talking about trees down. Do I have a home to go back to? Uh, thank goodness my wife did evacuate. I didn't have to really worry about her at that particular time. But yes, there was quite the, uh, the struggle going on from a personal and a professional standpoint. But you knew you had a job to do. You knew people were, were relying on you. And Channel 2 was lucky enough that uh, through the storm, the other TV stations had some technical issues or signed off. So we ended up being the only voice through the night of Hurricane Hugo. And were um, you actually broadcasting from the station, like in a secure room or something? Or tell us about that. 
Well, we all fanned out. I went to the National Weather Service at the airport. Uh, Dan Ashley ended up going up to our transmitter site in Allwindaw, and we were able to broadcast. That's another place we could broadcast from. Terry Casey and Leslie Lyles, our main anchor team at that time, went out to the EOC, which, if folks remember, the roof was being pulled off there. So they had quite an experience. Um, I broadcast as long as I could over where I was. And then we had to put, at that time, we had those big live trucks with the big antenna. We had to pull the antenna down. The winds were too strong. And so Dan Ashley became the one. I was actually on the phone with him, giving him briefings because I was at the weather service, looking at radar, looking at all the computer models, getting all the data to him. But thankfully, the phone stayed up. So he was able to continue to give people updated information uh, because I was feeding him information and also our teams in the field were feeding him information. But no, we, we had to leave our building because we knew it would not be secure. And I'm glad we did because when we came back, um, there was quite a bit of damage there. What was your biggest takeaway from the experience as a whole? You know what, uh, Bill? I think we did a really good job leading up to the storm. I think we really did a good job during the storm. I think the biggest shock for us was after the storm, that there's an aftermath that will last for days and weeks and months and even years. And I think, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's in and out and we can pick up the pieces. But boy, when you walked outside that next day and you looked at your beautiful city, um, torn apart piece by piece. Those pine trees were like oh. toothpicks. Were they not like toothpicks? And that smell. I mean, you know, we just did a, a, a Hurricane Hugo kind of retrospective uh, earlier this year. And I went out to the Francis Marion National Forest. And I remember driving through there and seeing the trees bent or just snapped about 30 feet up. And now you go and those trees, a lot of them have regrown, have grown again and after being replanted. So but I remember that smell. I remember just the video of from above where all the trees were snapped. There were so many trees that went uh, down there that the trees could wrap around the planet uh, several times. It was it, a lot of trees went went down on that. Those yeah, pine trees were like crazy. You know, it, it was it was crazy. But that would probably be my takeaway that that, uh, you know, you, you got to pace yourself because this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You go through the storm. Unfortunately, you have to go through it and you have to come out the other side. And the other side is pretty ugly, too, where you have to really, you know, kind of just. But the community comes together. Yes, they do. As a yeah. result of the storm. Yeah, I think that was probably the best part. There's the good and the bad. And that was the good seeing, you know, each other other people helping each other whether so be, rob you know. so, so rob you know that there's um you know there's a lot of new new people moving here that's never experienced this before and i think about it i'm sure you do too um God, we don't want them to be uh, we're all going to have anxiety as it approaches right. or you think but what can you brief them about here on on my pleasant magazine podcast that would maybe help them be less stressed? That's a great question too, Bill, because uh, we do have so many people living here uh, who weren't here for uh, during Hurricane Hugo. Uh, and we just don't know when it's going to happen. There's going to be another big storm. It won't be named Hurricane Hugo because that name has been retired, but there will be another storm. So we've got to prepare each and every year, each and every storm. So if you're new to the area, what do you do? Well, you have to find a reliable source of information uh, to get you that information you need. The computer models, the radar, the satellites, everything is so much better than it was in 1989. We were using a radar that was what we call the WSR, the Weather Service Radar 57. That was in 1957 we were using for Hurricane Hugo. So we have the technology uh, we have the computer modeling. It's not going to be perfect, but I think we can give folks a pretty good heads up on when the storm might hit, where it might hit, and when and if it does hit, what to expect. So with social media, there's a lot of misinformation out there that we have to weed through now that we didn't have to uh, during Hurricane Hugo. Okay, so the number one thing on top of your list, being the meteorologist superstar you are, is uh, is so don't pay attention to social media. As you said at the beginning of that, get a reliable source. What would be another thing that you would mention? Just be ready, have a plan. And just in case, now let's just say you put your kit together and you can go to your website. I know on our website, we've got great information, uh, a tutorial about what needs to be in your kit, put it together, put it in a plastic container, stick it in the garage. You may need it this year. You may not, but at least you've got it. So you can take it and go if you need to evacuate. Uh, and listen to the government uh, leaders, the officials. If they say you need to evacuate, most likely you, you shouldn't evacuate because 
believe me, if you hang on too long, it's going to be harder to get out and the anxiety will build up. One of the things that is unique about a hurricane, you see it coming versus yes. a tornado or something. So you can be prepared. I have to share this with you. And if you go to www.hugomagazine.com, that's Hugo Magazine. You can actually flip through the digital pages of the magazine. So that a bit, but, but I remember uh, Bob Sheet, Dr. Yeah. Sheets, you remember him, right? Absolutely. He was he, he was in charge of the hurricane center down in Miami at the time Hugo hit. And he came back into town and stayed at then at back then it was called the Omni. And he was there and he invited me to to ha- to meet with him. Uh, and uh, he went through the magazine and he said, Bill, your magazine saves people's lives. And I said, I'm just a publisher. What are you what are you saying? He said, no, Bill. By going through your magazine and people seeing the devastation a hurricane can, can cause, people will be more likely to evacuate. Therefore, you are saving people. And I was so taken by that, uh, Rob. It, just, it stuck with me my whole life. He was such a nice man, wasn't he? He was and uh, is. And, and, uh, and again, you're right. I mean, pictures tell the story. Videos tell the story. For those who weren't here during Hurricane Hugo, we look around each and every day and look how beautiful our city is, our low country is. But um, but we know when a hurricane comes in and all you have to do is look at pictures of, uh, you know, what's happened recently and over the last few years, last year, especially where we had so many storms. So um, I think everybody needs to know that uh, those pictures and other places could eventually be us again after, you know, 32 years since Hurricane Hugo. The her- magazines, whether it's Mount Pleasant Magazine, Rob, or whether it's the Storm of the Century Magazine, the Hugo Magazine, they capture a moment in time. And it's there at that point in time. So uh, the Hugo magazine, it was uh, it was a labor of love. And the, the, and if people go to the, my website, Rob, uh, MontPleasantMagazine.com and search Hugo or Hugo stories, we've got some fantastic, you know, you were yeah. you were one of the people in the story. I took a picture of you in front of the disc. You remember that? Yes. The disc. yes. No, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great reference, Bill. And, and I, like I said, it is part of my official Hugo file. Uh, that I have. I am honored. I'm honored to be part of your Hugo file. That's cool. So we sold a lot of those. I was so concerned as a publisher because I had never put together a magazine uh, without ads in it because that's normally what, you know, what, 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 how you can afford to do it. Right. I sold, I sold a lot of those magazines, a lot of those magazines. So, well, I I would encourage anybody to go back and look at it and, uh, and just, it's interesting reading. It kind of gives you perspective and maybe, can help someone, like you say, save lives. It might give someone that little extra push to say, you know what? I'm not staying. I'm getting out of here. I can rebuild my home, but I can't rebuild my family. There you go. Happens. You've been a friend over these many years. You are a great uh, uh, personality on TV. You always get voted uh, best of, either one of the best or the best in our best of, and that's going on right now. But listen, uh, thanks again. You're, you're, we, the community loves you, Rob. So uh, Mount Pleasant Magazine, your friend of Mount Pleasant Magazine. And uh, and like you said earlier on, Hugo bonds people. We would have been bonded anyway, but Hugo seriously bonds people together for any event like that. Mother Nature's got a wrath about her, does she not? Absolutely. And uh, when you go through something with someone uh, else the same time, uh, yeah. And we still stay in contact with all the people who were here at that time. But Bill, thank you for being a friend as well. And thank you for what you continue to do each and every day. And, uh, you know, outside of hurricane season, basically just letting people know how beautiful Mount Pleasant is. And, and we've been a resident here for 34 years and this is home and, and I wouldn't be, want to be anywhere else. Ditto's from this side of the uh, screen, uh, Bob. <laughs> thank you again for being on Mount Pleasant uh, Magazine Podcast.com. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Thanks for spending your time with the Mount Pleasant Magazine Podcast. Your community, your podcast. Listen to past and future episodes at mountpleasantpodcast.com.